Despite my love for video games, I actually grew up reading a lot more books than I did playing video games, and particularly like fantasy type novels. Because my favorite thing about those type of books is that they use a lot of descriptive language. And because of that, every single person who reads the book paints a little different picture in their head of how the story and the world looks because of that descriptive language. For example, in the Harry Potter books, my vision of Hogwarts and that whole world was probably very different than how the movie turned out and how everyone else pictured that world. Now, because the world of video games is visually already built, and because the developers tend to set you on at least a semi-linear path, it's hard to get that extremely personalized feeling that you get from a book in a video game. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, however, comes very close to creating an experience that tailors itself to each player depending on how they think and perform. Every person that I've met who's played through this game has a very different experience depending on what attracted them through exploring the game's world and mechanics, and I still discover new things about this game every single week, even a year after it's been released. Now this video marks the beginning of my one year review series, where I'll be taking a look at all of the big Nintendo published games a year after their release, and looking at not only how they performed at launch, but also how they've been supported over the year and what the future for that series might look like. Now, because Breath of the Wild has been out for about a year and a day now when this is going up, there are gonna be some minor spoilers in this review. I just wanna put that out there. Nothing too game breaking, but just be aware. Now, this has already been hailed as Game of the Year 2017, but today I'm going to dissect Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. If you've heard anything about Breath of the Wild, it's probably about the vast open world and how it takes a lot of aspects from other open world games and then just puts a Zelda twist on them. I think that the bread and butter of what makes this a much better open world game than the others is the physics and the stamina systems. The world feels so real, largely because they nailed the idea of gravity and physics so well, which really allows you to think intuitively, just like you would in the real world. If you see a large pack of enemies at the bottom of a hill with a rock at the top, you might just try pushing the rock down the hill so it can roll down and take them all out quickly without using weapons. If you can't get across an icy river without freezing to death, try going up river a little bit and chopping down a tree nearby to make a bridge for you to cross. The game is almost so real that it feels sort of counterintuitive at first, like wow, I never would have thought a game would even try to make me make my own bridge, but this game does that. Another huge part of what makes exploring fun is the stamina wheel. This is also one of the things that gives you a sense of progression in this game. You can climb anything and glide or swim wherever you want, but you'll only have a finite amount of time to do so depending on how much stamina you have. This makes each climb and glide a different experience, forcing you to think about the best path you can perceive without tiring yourself out. As you progress through the game, you can upgrade your stamina wheel, of course, allowing you to take longer climbs that someone else who took a different path and didn't upgrade their stamina wheel enough might not have been able to take. Because the game gives you so much power and so many options to explore, while also limiting that power so that it can't be abused, it really makes this one of the most fun exploration experiences I've ever experienced in a game. Through exploring this world, you're going to find a lot of fruits and nuts and herbs and just about everything else. The gathering and crafting is pretty different from most systems, but it's still addicting. Pretty much every corner of the world is packed with some type of goodie, even if it's not super useful. And although I absolutely adore the Elder Scrolls series, the density of differing items in each part of this world really makes Skyrim feel empty when you compare the two. While many items do end up making the same meal with the same attribute as a few others, they're still different depending on what type of region you're in and the climate that you're in, which even further helps with immersion. In the jungle region, you might find some mighty bananas, and in the hills surrounding a mountain region, you might find some mighty thistle, and while they both give you that same attack power boost when cooked, they're different because of the place in which you found them. This is definitely my favorite cooking system in an open world game as it feels very necessary while also being very fun. 
I spent a quarter of my time in this game just hunting wild animals or wandering around figuring out the best place to farm mighty bananas, and I'm totally okay with that, even happy. I tend to focus on the armor and weapon crafting aspects of crafting systems in general when it's normally implemented in games, but I think that the fact that this system is exclusively for food and potions was a big part of what made this game stand out. The weapons and armor system is maybe the biggest thing that I can find some flaws in. Each weapon has a very limited durability, meaning you have to pick and choose which enemies you want to fight or not. Because the weapons break so easily, it makes them a lot more lucrative and exciting when you pick them up, but it also encourages hoarding and just avoiding combat in general to save your weapons. There's a very limited amount of weapons you can hold at once, and while the storage can be slowly upgraded, I still found myself holding on to quite a few rare weapons that I didn't want to break for the entire game, which limited my space quite a bit. There is of course a house with some minor storage options to unlock, but I honestly didn't figure this out until later in the game, so I just held on to four of them, like the four main kingdom weapons, for pretty much my whole playthrough. Because weapons break so easily, I also found myself avoiding quite a few simple combat situations just because I wanted to save my weapons for the main quest. I passed multiple camps and mini bosses knowingly just because I knew I'd probably just break half of my weapon stash in exchange for some crappy bow that I don't even need or some sort of similar award like that. Like I said earlier, I do enjoy the exclusive cooking system, but maybe some sort of minor weapon crafting system to ensure that you always leave town with at least a reasonable stash of weapons would have made my experience a whole lot better. As for the armor system, I really have nothing bad to say. There's dozens of clothing pieces to be found throughout the world, and they can all even be dyed in several different colors. There's definitely some obvious upgrades to take, but there's no one definitive armor set that everyone needs to use. Most armor pieces are viable depending on what situation you're in. The upgrade system added a good amount of progression to the game as well, although I would have preferred something a little less cookie cutter with more customization and personalization options. Now, Nintendo IPs are very rarely hailed for their stories, and while Breath of the Wild doesn't have a wildly in-depth lore, there is a good bit of story compared to other Zelda games. This is also the first Zelda game to feature fully voice acted cutscenes, which sounds great, but honestly, they're few and far between, as well as pretty short and shallow. Being someone who's read multiple Warcraft and other video game novels like that, I love in-depth game lore, so this really isn't enough story to make me happy. But looking at this objectively as a Nintendo game, I can be happy with the steps forward that they took here. The story is almost Dark Souls-esque in that you have to search for the story if you want to learn about it, which isn't a bad thing, especially for these big AAA games where most casual players probably aren't interested in the lore at all. The main story is basically the same as all the others. Ganon takes Princess Zelda and Link has to save her but this is the first game to at least loosely link all the games together. It's explained that there's a cycle of Ganon rising and then Link and Zelda being born to defeat him every hundred years or so. The game then sets you off to defeat all of the divine beasts and bring together the four kingdoms of Hyrule. Each kingdom features cutscenes with the four dead champions as well as four pseudo champion types to help you defeat each divine beast. They did a really great job in designing all these characters, and I did fall in love with a few, particularly the Zora champions, Sidon and Mipha. Those were great, but I think they really missed a chance in developing these characters more. Great characters make great stories, but I won't get too far into that because like I said, it's a Nintendo IP, so we gotta take the story with a grain of salt. The Divine Beast act as Breath of the Wild's dungeons. These definitely aren't your normal dungeons though. They're actually pretty small in size compared to other Zelda games and feature little to no combat. They're rather just a series of puzzles to solve using your Sheikah powers. I won't say that I hated these dungeons, but I will say that they aren't as memorable as other Zelda dungeons. I haven't played Ocarina of Time in probably over five years, but when I close my eyes, I can still picture multiple sections of both the water and fire temples in my mind but when I was trying to help a friend navigate through Vav Naboris the other day, I honestly couldn't remember a lot or anything about it because it looks so similar to every other dungeon in the game. There's also the issue of almost the exact same boss being included at the end of every beast. 
there are some minor changes to the mechanics of each fight, but nothing too big. If they are going to keep the same mechanics, they could have at least made each boss aesthetically different from each other, as it feels super monotonous. The Divine Beasts were honestly my least favorite part of this game, which is pretty disappointing considering they're pretty much the main goal. Throughout your journey around Hyrule, you'll also come across hundreds of mini dungeons, known as shrines. These are basically mini Divine Beasts, each with a different type of puzzle that carries some type of theme throughout the whole thing. These were a really great break from exploration and definitely one of the best parts of this game. My favorite shrines were the ones where you would sort of run into some type of puzzle in the overworld and then spend some time figuring out this puzzle to find a shrine just to have that shrine tell you that you've already proved yourself worthy by solving the overworld puzzle. Most of these were much more fun than the Divine Beasts themselves and they'll probably be the most memorable parts of the game for me. There's also quite a few side quests in this game as well, but they were often just fetch type shallow tasks, but the dozens of varying types of shrines is really what makes this game shine. Breath of the Wild is also the first Zelda game to feature paid DLC and came at a price point of $20. The first wave came in the form of the Master Trials, adding some new armor to the game, increased difficulty in the form of the Master Mode, and most importantly, the Trial of the Sword. Trial of the Sword is a new endgame mode you can play to slightly upgrade your Master Sword. You start out naked, in a room with no weapons and forced to use your knowledge of the game's mechanics to defeat every single enemy in the room to progress to the next one. While it might seem counterintuitive to create a mode entirely based on the game's super simple combat system, each room really does force you to utilize every mechanic the game has to offer. Some rooms feature heavy thunderstorms where you won't be able to use your normal metal weapons very long, and some force you to rely on the wind glider skills to hop from platform to platform. The Trial of the Sword really takes all of the fun game mechanics and puts them into a linear, gauntlet-style challenge and in my opinion, is the best part of the entire expansion pass. A few months after the first wave, we saw the release of Champion's Ballad, which promised more new armor as well as some additional story content. There is indeed quite a bit of content to play through, but I stay story content very loosely. There's about six hours of extra content to play through, but while the gameplay is compelling and worthwhile, the story is once again lacking severely. Like I said, I can't hound Nintendo too hard about this as it is a Nintendo game, but when you call this DLC the Champion's Ballad and promise new story content for months on end, I would have expected more character development of the Champions at least. Instead, we just get more shallow information coupled with some quest content that ends in repeated boss fights from the main game's Divine Beast. Once all the quest content is done, you get the Master Cycle, which does add quite a bit more fun as well, and slightly makes up for the disappointing story. The game by itself is a master of its own mechanics, an extension of unique challenges based around these mechanics was much welcomed with its DLC, but that's really all I got from it. Considering the $20 price point, this is actually quite worth it, and I overall think this game offers at least 70 hours of great fun altogether. Breath of the Wild was in development for almost five years before its release, and because it breaks so many barriers that previous Zelda games had not, it's really hard to call exactly what the next game in this series is going to look like. Will they keep the open world theme with emphasis on exploration and gathering, and if so, how do they innovate that style? I do really like the open world setting, but it does present a problem in that there's so many existing open world games already and it seems like the genre has almost been pushed to the edge and can't go any further. While it might be difficult to make sure that there's enough content to really make a new game a separate experience from Breath of the Wild, I think it would be great if we got at least one more game with the same physics e engine and just general idea of this, similar to what Majora's Mask was to Ocarina of Time. There's never been a true continuation of story between Zelda games, but I think the ideal sequel to Breath of the Wild would continue in the same world after the defeat of Ganon, where the world has been rebuilt and perhaps under fire from a new, never before seen enemy. We could go and revisit each kingdom and see how the characters have progressed. Like imagine going back to the Zora Kingdom and Prince Sidon is now King Sidon and he's got like a big beard with that same smile thing going on. Oh, that'd be so awesome. It would really give these characters a second chance 
to be developed properly and it would be a crime not to take the chance to develop them more. As for the progression of the actual gameplay itself, like I said, it's really hard to call how they can push this genre forward even more when it's already been pushed so hard. Um, one thing that I do wish for in this next game is maybe a more comprehensive crafting system with more options to customize yourself and just a more individualized experience towards the end game with skill trees or, you know, I don't want them to just fully make it an experience points and leveling system, but a 20 heart link who's beat the game is not very different from another player's 20 heart link who's beat the game and I feel like they just need to put more RPG elements in there to further individualize the experience. I also have a video about a theory for a co-op type game but where you play both Link and Zelda. Um, I don't want to talk about that too much because I've already talked about it but I will leave a link in the description to that video if you'd like to watch that as well. Um, if you've got any feedback on what might be in the next Zelda game or how you felt about Breath of the Wild. I know there's already been a lot said about it, but let me know down in the comments if you got anything to say. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed and subscribe to my channel for the latest Switch content available. This is Max from Max Culture, and thank you so much for watching. Happy one year anniversary Switch. Woo!